one Ta-da! start ก็ยินดีต้อนรับทุกคนนะคะวันนี้เราก็จะมาคุยกันนะคะเป็นโรดโชว์นะคะหรือเราจะมาเจอใครบ้างเดี๋ยวเราจะมาเจอทีมงานก่อนนะคะ So let's see who are to be the moderator for today ค่ะสวัสดีค่ะชื่อโซมานะคะเดี๋ยวเราจะมาเจอมอเตอร์เตอร์ของพวกเรากันนะคะขอแนะนำคุณคอร์นี่ค่ะเป็นเพจของเอ็นดีนะคะค่ะคอร์นี่จงจงที่ hello right now Hi everybody. This is Courtney. I'm uh, here in Bangkok, and very happy to see this kick off and see everyone here too. Awesome. Next one, Nakha. We have Kun Winarin, Nakha, is co-founder of Thailand Clean Air Network. Next one is Miss Winarin, co-founder of Thailand Clean Air Network. Good evening, everybody. I am Winarin Luditanon. I'm the co-founder of Thailand Clean Air Network. It's very nice to meet all of you. And next, I would like to, invite, uh, to introduce Kun Kin, who is the moderator, the co-moderator for this session. Hi, I'm Sukun Fujaron. I'm the senior traffic management officer, senior air traffic management officer from Aero Thai. I'm the co-moderator for today. Pass my duty on to Kun Kin now. Bye. So I'm gonna and I'm gonna have to pass on my duty to Kun Wina as well. But as I've said earlier, that it is my uh, pleasure to virtually meet all of you and thank you for joining us for this session. If there is any question at all, please do so. Ask us uh, or put it in the the Q and A box. If there is any technical problem at all, whether it is for the interpretation or other technical problem, please do share with us as well through the chat box or the Q and A. We're going to be trying to fix any issues that you may have. So I would like to give the floor to Kunwina. So good evening again. I would like to start by introducing our group. So we are the collaboration between two groups, which is the Thailand Clean Air Network and Circular Design Lab. So by way of background, uh, today is a very important day because it is the day, uh, the kickoff day of our webinar, which got one, is uh, the beginning of the whole series of about nine sessions from today until December. So people may say that we start from Mother's Day to Father's Day, and I would have to confirm that, yes, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to be delivering sessions relating uh, educational sessions, which we will hear from from uh, experts and also for the information from that uh, the Blue Book, the Thailand Clean Air Blue Book. And also we're going to be hearing from a number of experts and also to hear the recommendations and the way forward as well. So if you uh, are interested, please do check out our website. So by way of introduction, I would like to uh, just go over a little bit of uh, introduction of our Thailand Clean Air Network. So we're, we're, we've uh, founded probably about three years already. And it started off with just us, you know, people, about seven of us. We are quite concerned with the issue of air pollution in Thailand, and it's been getting worse and worse like every year. And I just, we just think that we cannot really live with it anymore, and we have to really do something about it. And fortunately, we are uh, supported by a number of experts who are very uh, keen on helping us and also to working with us as well because the problem that we're facing is very complex and it requires the uh, scientific knowledge and also the expertise from a number of uh, scholars and who one of whom is with us today as well which is Dr. Wirun and also another expert is Dr. Wanisa and Kun A or Kun Pen Chom. So this is just by way of an introduction. So in terms of the way forward, we're going to be uh, going to detail at a later stage, but uh, I'm going to go over, uh, going to pass the mic on to uh, Courtney to go over the Circular Design Lab. Great, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to see so many people here. 
uh, live with us. We know that you're extremely busy. It's a pandemic. So many opportunities to do other things in terms of Zoom sessions. And here you are having a happy hour um, talking about the cause and the science behind the air pollution. So just to share very briefly um, a little bit about this roadshow. Um, as, you, as Kuhn Wiener already mentioned, it's a collaborative effort led by 100% by volunteers on both sides. So the Circular Design Lab is a pop-up citizen-driven open innovation platform. We started only last year. Uh, the idea was, can we solve as humans, as community, as people just living uh, on planet Earth um, without the organizational affiliation necessarily, but how do we tackle some of these big issues? We started with waste management, and then uh, we also expanded to air pollution and unsustainable fast fashion. So as a result of going through a process of systemic design in 2019, we were looking for leverage points. How do we really shift, move the needle in terms of these big issues that sometimes feel so abstract or something that is so powerful and beyond the reach of what we can actually do? And air pollution is one of those issues that has become increasingly worse, uh, particularly from uh, the Asia Pacific region, but certainly global. And there's more and more research coming out linking these kinds of issues and effects that are harmful and toxic. So um, we're not here to, to, to paint the, the picture of the apocalyptic scenario, but what we're here to do is reframe what's possible. And part of that pathway is certainly education awareness. And what we wanna do is dig into the data, the facts and the evidence, um, which simply cannot be done in one hour, which is why we're doing this Mother's Day to Father's Day five month uh, process with hopefully everybody and yourself included to join us along the way. Um, that being said, action is a piece of this, and that's where we kind of wanted you to see from this, uh, this site that we have, righttocleanair.com, that we can learn, but we can also take action. And action doesn't mean only from uh, the convention. And so therefore, we've also thought about other ways to access ways to think about it. So we have the arts involved, we have education, we have um, workshops as well, hybrid too. So if you are happening to be in Bangkok, we do have a few things that we'll be doing on the ground, more of that on the website, more of that later. Um, but we do hope that you see yourself as a part of the way in which you can join. Um, and so therefore, if you would like to volunteer, uh, be involved or connect us with others in the ecosystem, we're using Thailand as the case study and the opportunity to help build one of the first clean air acts um, of, the, of the region, actually. We know that the Philippines has established one from 1999. Singapore has something similar, but actually uh, this is a transboundary complex issue. So it's certainly, uh, we're using this space of Thailand and the amazing, incredible research and work that's already been done through the Thailand Clean Air Network um, to help us understand that journey. But real simply, uh, the 200 page document called the Blue Paper is in English and in Thai. And in terms of making it accessible, we wanted to spread out that. And so therefore we have these wonderful uh, authors and experts with us to walk us through the science. So um, in brief, thanks so much for, for being here and certainly hope to see you amongst all of the different things that are happening in the next several months. And with that, over to the moderators. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ken, uh, Ken and, and Wina. Thank you, Courtney. So to pick up from uh, Courtney, I would like to just uh, go over that uh, for today's uh, session. We are trying to cover the details that is included in the Thailand blue paper, the, uh, sorry, the, the blue paper. We have already uh, published two publications. The first one is the white paper, which is basically the, the layout or the foundation work of that we have done so far in terms of air pollution in Thailand and then we spent about seven or to eight months to go into details to conduct site visits and also to interview a number of people the stakeholders who are affected by air pollution in order to really establish the the problems that are facing and then we included all of that Clean Air Today, the information from the, uh, the blue paper and present to you in a more simplistic way. And for today's session, the chapters that we'll cover is basically the chapters relating to the cause and also the science behind air pollution and also the health impacts 
And as I've already mentioned, we have invite we have invited uh, our authors of the Clean Air Blue paper to join us for this session as well, and also to share the findings and key takeaways that they have already put into the uh, Clean Air Blue paper to with all of you for this session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Wanisa Surapipit. She is the atmospheric scientist and modeler. So uh, atmospheric scientist, please excuse my tie. Um, she works at the National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand. And she has been working with us with the Thailand Clean Air Network for since the very beginning. And I do have questions for Dr. Vanisa as well. First of all, I would like to ask Dr. Wanisa to explain in simple language for the audience about what is air pollution, what is PM 2.5, and what is the uh, toxins that are included that are in the, the particulate matter. What are they? What are the health impacts? And also, what is the origin, the source? of such pollution? And is it different? Is there any different in terms of the source between the uh, Bangkok and other provinces of Thailand? So I would like to give the floor to Dr. Wanisa. So good evening. So, okay, should I start? Okay, everybody hear me? Right, so thank you for the introduction. It is my pleasure as well to be here, to be uh, sharing with all of you uh, in respect of PM 2.5. PM 2.5 has been like a household term that we're we're not. I think we're all now now all familiar with it. And uh, personally, I do uh, worked on this issue for quite a while now. And for the last two years, I have uh, been working even more intensely. And I've been to Nepal and also Pakistan, and they are facing very similar pro problem to Thailand. But when I came back to Thailand, I can say that, you know, in our country, especially in Chiang Mai, the problem is very severe. And it is my absolute pleasure that I got invited by the Thai Thailand Clean Air Network to join all of you to work on this issue. And also to share with you, to, to be sharing with you the insights as well. Uh, because for this particular issue, the pollution control department, which is my, uh, which I used to work for them, uh, has been trying very hard to to really raise awareness. But I do say that the effort is not really uh, effective. So if I may start by presenting my slides from your question, Kun Vinarin. What is PM 2.5? PM 2.5 is a, a type of air pollution. And we first heard of this PM 2.5 from, uh, from China. It started from China. And another term that I would like to put out is the, uh, air, uh, the term air quality, because PM 2.5 also covers a number of other substances, the gas and, this, and so on and so forth. So uh, Narit is where I work. So in terms of the sources, the, the, so, the source or the cause of air pollution or PM 2.5, well, basically they exist in nature as well. But what is more, concern, uh, more of a concern for us is that nowadays we live in a very developed environment and we're not living purely based on nature anymore. We have vehicles, we have fuel uh, combustion, that can cause, which can be the source of air pollution or, or these tiny particulate matter. By 2.5, that means 2.5, the meaning of 2.5 is actually the diameter of the particulate matter. If we go uh, further in the slides, you can see uh, better. Okay, so th for this slide, you can see in the, in the center, 
you may imagine you may you may imagine that that the particulate matter has to have like a round shape, but that's not always the case. Two point five PM two point five is basically uh, the diameter of that particulate matter, which is very very tiny. PM two point five is actually one fourth of PM ten that we've already might heard of PM ten. If we imagine particulate matter as a tiny grain in the air, we can uh, also try to imagine further that they they are they consist of a number of elements as well. They may have uh, inside them they have soot or you know dust, and also other aerosols that are caused by uh, combustion and also heavy metals and other pollutants that can cause health impacts. And that is POPs that we're gonna be go over into, de uh, go into details at a later stage. And they can have the form of liquid and also gas as well. So the chemical reaction, the combination of chemical reaction can also cause uh, the toxic effect, as you may, uh, the, the chemical reaction and also the, the, in combination with the particulate matter can also cause and not cause uh, the health impact or, or any harm effect. But, you know, we're gonna be going into details. As you may already heard of the SO2 and, and ammonia and so on and so forth, So ammonia and other, other substances can, can latch itself to this particulate matter. If I may go back to the uh, previous slide, if you look at this picture, it, when we mention 2.5, that's the diameter, as I mentioned. Previously, we mentioned PM10. PM10 is on the right-hand side of this, this chart. Normally, uh, nowadays, uh, the size of the particulate matter is less than one. You can see the, the mountain-like shape here on the, on the graph on the right. Uh, in the past, the size of the particulate matter is about 10 in diameter. And this second hill here is, the, is when the size is less than one micron. And with this size, it can enter our body directly and also go directly to our lungs. And even if you look at the third wave here, the third hill here, it is even smaller than 0 0.1. And also virus such as, very, uh, the, such as the COVID-19 virus can latch itself onto this particular matter and also enter our body as well. Now we're this uh, two particulate matter that has a size smaller than 0 0.1 is, you know, more uh, to the left side of, of this chart. But it's not certain yet as to uh, the harm of the particulate, particulate matter of that size and also the, uh, take, taking into account the effect of COVID-19 as well. So going to the next slide. There, there has been estimations, the estimates conducted globally relating to the source of PM2.5. And what we found is that the source of, or the origin of PM2.5 is about 10, about 10 percent caused by man-made activities, which is uh, towards the left side of this graph. You can see here about 10%. You know, when we see haze in the air, when the sky is not so clear, that can also be caused by the man-made activities as well. But what is more worrisome is on the next slide here, you can see that all over the world, the large city, we can see the, the the horizon here in, in these pictures, whether it is in Los Angeles, in Paris, all of these cities in these photos have been encountering the, the issue of air pollution, which 
it has been made certain that air pollution can cause premature deaths, especially from aer uh, aerosol or PM 2.5. And all of these major cities, there are uh, most of the people are living in major cities and they're being exposed to and affected by air pollution, that is. For example, Los Angeles, they have the so many vehicles and they have large amount of nitrogen oxide and also VOC. Because VO VOC is very important because it is not it does not come from only from vehicles. It comes from plants, from trees as well. It is an organic matter. So when it reacts to uh, sunlight, it can cause photochemical smog. This is a normal chemical reaction, but it will become, it will not be normal if it is combined with other precursors or other chemicals. Because, you know, if we take into account the, the exhaust fumes or other types of pollution from industrial factories or from other places or factors, all of these, they contain VOC and when they and when they react with uh, sunlight, it can cause uh, harmful effects. In terms of the solution to air pollution, we have to take a look at carbon dioxide, ozone, nitrogen oxide, and also PM 2.5 as well. America has been facing this problem quite intensely and I think in the last decade, we can see from the, the, the red bars here, they, use, they spent about 10 years to actually solve or, or uh, mitigate the problem of air pollution in respect of PM 2.5. And this is only for uh, Los Angeles. So the trends of all these developed countries, they can successfully reduce the, the, the amount of air pollution, but the time that it took it's quite uh, long as well for, for some, it can take as much as uh, 50 years. And also air pollution can have an effect on climate change as well. It can cause extreme weather, it can cause, it can prevent the sun from getting to earth. It can cause rain, off season rain. And this is one of the effects that we can see quite uh, frequently lately. And uh, I am, I think there are researches that this being conducted in Thailand as well. The similar research has been conducted in India, in China, and for Thailand, we are in the process of conducting such research. And I think we have uh, mentioned that in our blue paper as well. and the source of air pollution. You can see these tiny circles shows the ratios of uh, the, the, the source of air pollution. And you can see that in each part of the world, the depictions in each tiny circles are different. There are research conducted by the PCD and also AIT and also researchers from Chulalongkorn University and other universities as well. We can see that the ratio depict that automotive sector or traffic is the main cause of air pollution in cities. About 30% or one third uh, com comes from the manufacturing sector. But for the northern part of Thailand, we see that the main cause of air pollution basically comes from open burning, agricultural burning, forestry burning on mountains or highlands. I have not uh, bring with me today the, 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 the graph because the research is quite relatively new. I think that's uh, all of my slides. But still, uh, to, to basically put a, give you an answer, Kunwina, I think we have to study further in terms of the impact on our health. I'm not gonna go into detail because I think Dr. Warun will be touching 
uh, we'll, be, we'll touch upon on that uh, matter. But I can say the PM 2.5 have effects on climate change and also our health as well. And I think with that, it should be basically a trigger point for the policymakers to, to do something about this because we they have to be concerned about the health of their citizens and also they have to be concerned about climate change as well. These are basically the two fundamental and very essential topics. If I'm, and that would be all from my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wanisa, that is very insightful. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the second speaker, Dr. Virun Lim Sawat, who is the head of Society and Health Institute at the Ministry of Public Health. Dr. Virun uh, is basically double doctor. He is actually a medical doctor working at uh, hospitals in other province of Thailand as executives and as uh, other roles. And also he has high interest in anthropology, human anthropology, and he has uh, graduated with master's and also doctorate degree from Harvard in that particular matter. matter. And so I would like to ask Dr. Virun further from, from the questions that I asked the previous speaker as to the health effects or health impacts caused by air pollution or what we call environmental pathway. So can you uh, explain to us what is the env environmental pathway? And also, can you please clarify the air quality standard because you know in Thailand, I think it is quite it is a matter of this quite confusing as to the air quality standard in Thailand and also uh, those recommended by WHO or other organizations. And also, can you provide us recommendations in terms of how to raise awareness, how to be more educated, and how to protect ourselves and our loved ones from the impact of air pollution? So thank you, Kun Wienerin, and also Dr. Vanisa for giving us a very insightful details about PM 2.5, and also what are the concerns of PM 2.5. I think the very important important thing is that apart from apart from the concern about the particulate matter itself, we really have to look at the source or the origin of such particulate matter. We have to see like where it comes from and what, and the components of PM 2.5 as well so that we can really understand as to what we are facing and also what can be the impact towards our health. A moment ago, Dr. Vanisa, uh, sorry, uh, Kun Wina asked uh, a question about, about the topics that I have uh, put in the the clean air blue paper, which is the environmental pathway. And this is what is presented in the blue paper. This is a very simple diagram presented by the World Health Organization. And they put this in air quality guideline 2006 edition. This graph can be, you know, very easily overlooked. But to me, I think this particular diagram is very essential for us to protect the health of our people, ourselves, our loved ones. It is a, a concept that I would like to present to, the, to everybody, not just the citizen, but, but everybody working in the field of uh, air pollution that they're try, trying to tackle the problem of air pollution. This is basically a conceptual framework that we have to really understand for us to be able to work on the topic of air pollution. I'm not really sure why, why they call it the environmental pathway, but for me, I, I translate it as to, uh, as the pathway of the effects from air pollution to our health. So if we look at this diagram, there are six boxes. And from these six boxes, the three 
boxes on the right from number four, five, and six, these are the health impacts. While on the left, the three boxes on the left, number one, two, and three, is the air pollution, the origin of air pollution. So if we start, start by trying to understand the air quality report that is in box number three, basically the concentration of pollutants in a particular area at a particular time. I used to try to explain that what is concentration? The concentration value that can really uh, lead to the air quality level. If to compare this, to give you a, a, a simple example, is it's like we're in a room and in that room at a particular moment in our house, there is a person or there is one person in that in that room and they lit up one incense but if we compare that to a situation where there is 100 people in the room and everybody has one incense and they light it it's basically it will be 100 people with 100 incense sticks and the concentration from that incense sticks will be very high and basically people in that room will be suffocated. But if we take the same example, but switch, it, switch uh, the circumstance to where we are outdoors, there will be wind speed and other factors. It's like, basically it's like we open the window of our room and the smoke caused by the incense will basically be blown out of the window. And it's like the air quality in that room is better, but the source or the origin of that pollution still exists and remain unchanged. So if we really understand that factor, if we understand the air quality and we understand the correlation with the concentration, then we can see that at a particular time, as, as presented by Dr. Wanisa, that we may have a background value, for example, in Bangkok, we have traffic, uh, congest uh, traffic congestion, but at certain times, the air pollution may not be that severe or may not be uh, easily noticeable. But comparing the same situation to when the weather is not quite nice, it's like we're in the closed, uh, in the window that with the, all the windows closed and the, that's why the concentration increases. So that, this, that, is, that example is just to depict that we kind of focus on, on the concentration of PM2.5 more than the source, more than the, the climate condition at that particular moment. So for us to actually solve the problem, As I said that the concentration is in the box number three, which is which comes after box one and box two. So as, as a person, how can we fix the problem? How we can we uh, offer any solution? That is something that we have to really discuss and also to really think about like, can we fix it at the source or how can we, can we fix it at emission? But for, for uh, this particular session, I would like to direct your attention to the last three boxes, number four to six. So based on the concentration leading to the uh, box number four, five, and six, there are two additional factors, which is the, the first one is exposure and also the dose. So in terms of exposure, there are relating factors relating to uh, exposure, which is at a particular concentration, we will have like a duration, the, the duration of exposure and also the amount of air that we breathe, that we inhale. So with different duration 
or with different amount of air of air intake. For example, uh, a normal person walking and a person who's uh, exercising or working out, the, the amount of oxygen, the amount of air will be different between these two persons. So with different level of exposure lead to different level of dose. So any kind of toxins that are that are included, that are embedded in the particulate matter PM 2.5, with different exposure, with a uh, different level of exposure and different level of dose, the health impacts will, of course, be different. And also another factor relating to the health effects is the sensitivity. So within the same household, let's, let's imagine, two children, who may have who may have received the same dose of air pollutants they can have different health effects because they have different sensitivity this is what we have to understand that uh because uh, in, in in order for us to actually prevent or conduct any measures in relation to air pollution, we have to understand the different effects that other that different people may have based on the, on their sensitivity. And if we are able to raise the awareness in this particular topic, we have to start by looking at our the members of our family who has more sensitivity, and among those people what are the protection that they need? So we can basically start backwards. We have to understand the sensitivity first of each person in our house. And then after we understand that, we can move backward to uh, box five to see how can we reduce the dose that they receive and how to reduce the dose, we have to look backward as well to box number four, which is exposure. How can we reduce the exposure? The first, first measure is to how to inhale less polluted air. First of all, we have to prohibit working out exercising in the area with high level of air pollution because working out increase the rate of inhalation and therefore increase the rate of air pollution that you're receiving and also to reduce the duration of exposure as well by reducing the exposure is to basically avoid going into the area uh, which is highly polluted and also to reduce the rate of inhalation, for example, by using respirators or using face mask, that can mitigate the risk of, of high exposure. Because even though we may not be able to always, always avoid going into the area which is highly polluted, but if we have protective gears, then we can reduce the, the chance or the amount of exposure that we may receive. So for those if we look at box, box number six, and for those who has very high sensitivity, using face mask or reducing the, the chance of having the exposure will be very beneficial. And if in the, uh, and also if we take examples from the COVID-19 situation, for those with high sensitivity, lockdown measures can be also applied. For those with very high sensitivity, in any particular area that is by that that is by setting up a safe zones for those with very high sensitivity and if we can you know make people understand that this particular concept they will be able to determine the appropriate measures that they can use in order to take care of uh, the, the members of their households. And to answer your question relating to the environmental pathway. And also, what is what is the second part of your question, Kunbina? The taking care and also the, the preventive measures for our loved ones. So moving on to the air 
the air quality standard. That is basically the concentration threshold or the standard that is set by each country and, and can be different from country to country as well. The reason why that standard or that threshold is different is because it depends on the level of pollution permitted to be emitted by the industrial sector. For example, going back to the, the room scenario, one room can be Thailand and one room can be the US. It depends whether we will allow our, kid, our kids in Thailand to stay in the room with full of incense smoke. Thailand may allow that, but the US may not. And this is only an example. The US may only allow 30 people to be in that particular room. And uh, according to the uh, WHO, It would be ideal. It would be ideal for a kid to be in the room with less than pe less than ten people lighting the incense stick. So basically, the air quality level is set based on based on that particular country's permission, or based on whether that country will allow their citizen to be in the area that is highly polluted or not? And if so, how many people can be in that particular area? It's basically a standard set for those emitting the pollution, you know? It is a standard set for those who are basically the cause of air pollution. If they, if they set quite low threshold, they will attract investors. But if they set high threshold, then they, will not, they may not attract that many investors. So it's really, it's really uh, an issue that has an economic element to it. What we are trying to propose or recommend through, uh, and also uh, what Thailand Clean Air Network is trying to push or encourage the Ministry of Public Health is that we're trying to shift the focus from box three concentration to box six, which is health, health impacts. We do not really want to focus on the concentration. We do not want to really, you know, be bring, uh, bringing the attention or focusing the attention only on the concentration, but we would like to bring the attention to the health effects or health impacts, especially for those with high sensitivity. And also to try to, to give them the better picture as to what would be the severity of those impacts for those who have very high sensitivity as well. I think that answers the question relating to the air quality level. Thank you very much, Dr. Virun. I think you have a very, painted a very good picture. And also, as you have, uh, as you shared earlier about the incense sticks, it's, it's like it depends on how big is your incense stick. Some, some, if you're a factory, if you're an industrial factory, you can emit more pollution. And that is basically a, a, another example. So thank you very much, Dr. Wirun. So without further ado, I would like to go to the third speaker of today, Ms. A or Kun Pen Chom Sa Tang, who is uh, at the Ecology Alert and Recovery Thailand Foundation. She is the director of the foundation and she has extensive experience And I would like to say that she is one of the advocates on the issue of air pollution. And she has been working in this particular area for more than 10 years with, exten with uh, extensive experience. And she has been trying to drive uh, the social movement relating to air pollution. She works with the business sector, the civil sector, and also the public sector as well for in order to achieve the solution and trying to find a agreeable solution towards uh, for all sectors. She also was very hands-on uh, with the event in Mataput Industrial Estate in, during, during which the air pollution level was quite severe. And also the issues, uh, and also from that particular event, 
we can see now that people in Rayong who has got cancer from the air pollution level was quite evident. So Kun uh, Penchom from the 3rd of August, from our last session, we have uh, basically tabled to the cabinet a set of legislations that you have uh, tabled to Kun Chuan Lik Pai as the president of the cabinet. And uh, on that particular day, Kun Chuan Lik Pai saw this particular picture. Uh, this kid has birth defects as a result of the exposure to dioxin by, by the mother. But this picture is from, from Vietnam. And I think most of us heard that the Agent Orange, which is the substance relating to the uh, Vietnam War. So questions to Kun Pen Chom. Uh, in Thailand, do we have the issue of dioxin exposure that is as severe as in Vietnam? And also, do we have any measures at the moment to prevent or to protect this particular issue? And also to solve the problem as well and to to mitigate and prevent it from uh, getting worse. So if I may, uh, on the questions whether we have any, any kids who, who have uh, the same condition or who are affected by dogs, and I can say that I cannot really give you a certain answer because from my research and from my studies, I do not really, I did not come across uh, any kids with the same birth defects, but by not being able to give you a certain answer doesn't mean that there's none. It's just that we may not have a strong enough information or database or diagnosis that that can can basically give us certain answers as to whether he or she has been exposed to dioxin. But uh, from my Further research, we have conducted research relating to the birth defects of newborns. And from my experience, the statistics of, of uh, kids or of newborns who have uh, birth defects, which is quite similar to those exposed with dioxin, I would say that the number of which is not, is not small. But there has not been one research in Thailand that specifically conducted to to see the number or to see the cause of such birth defects. The birth defects can be caused by mercury, lead, or other heavy metals, and including dioxin. And also, uh, as Kun Vina has mentioned, the or, uh, Agent Orange, which is uh, which was used in. Vietnam in during the the period of Vietnam War, and millions of Vietnamese people are ex were exposed to that particular substance, and from that, a num a hundred thousand newborns have birth defects as a result. But the the American uh, soldiers who who were on duty in that particular time, they have entered into the, uh, like a preventive measure, uh, prevent like a surveillance or some, some kind of a program that to, to watch whether they have been affected by the Agent Orange, but, and they found that most of the, uh, most of the personnel or soldiers who were on duty have diabetes and also, there is a possibility of other diseases as well. And there are disability that may occur as well. I, I, I came across one, one uh, research from a doctor in Thailand. It is uh, evident from that research that dioxin can also, can still cause cleft palate in newborns, in uh, even in the present days as well. But 
you know, to answer your question, I cannot really give you a certain or the exact number as to the person who, as to the kids or newborns who are affected by dioxin exposure. But there are other concerns as well because, you know, newborns nowadays, we have higher rates of disability in newborns. And I think, I, I believe that one of the factors is the environmental factors that cause such defect or such disability. As to how to prevent that, it is a very difficult question, I would say. The reason why it's difficult is because dioxin is, can be caused by nature or can be caused by incomplete combustion of substances uh, which have cl chl chlorine as a component, also uh, combustion in power plants and uh, other kind of plants as well. So if we look back to the situation in Thailand, we have to understand that Thailand has so many factories. When it was uh, an NGO, uh, in the past, we have reviewed a number of uh, projects in Mattaput area, and I can say that there are dioxin emissions in almost every project in that area. It just depends on how, uh, the level of dioxin that, that will be emitted. But I can say that almost every project has dioxin emission. Also, another issue is the control measures, the emission control measures from incinerators or from power plants and so on and so forth. For example, we have incinerators in Phuket and other province. What we found is that, and also in Samui as well. Also, there are incinerators located in other parts of Thailand as well. And from the report of the Pollution Control Department, they said that uh, according to that report, it is evident that there is no sufficient control measures for that incinerators. So since we do not have the scientific evidence to confirm on this, but we do have the uh, evidence on dioxin exhaust and uh, exhaust emission as well. For our foundation, we have been working on this issue for quite a while and and we found that dioxin can be absorbed quite well in uh, chicken eggs and also in the dairy product and we collected samples from five sources to, to measure the level of dioxin in Samusakon province. And in that province, we, uh, there is a uh, recycle plants, recycling plants, and also uh, factories working on electronic wastes as well. So the, the chicken eggs that we collected, uh, the, and from the, the samples that we collected, it's, uh, it's a free ranch chicken from, the samples, what we found is that we have, uh, we found that there is a very high level of dioxin in the chicken eggs and the, and the kids of the family who, you know, have chickens, they, they eat that, that eggs. The, and therefore from that research, we found that in that particular area, that particular area should be like the major source of dioxin emission into the environment. That's basically what we found from our research, but from that we still cannot confirm whether there is any person with ailments, whether they're male, female, or whether there are kids or adults who may have certain you know, health conditions as a result of dioxin. But we st what we are trying to, you know, keep track of that and also to, to conduct more research in, in that respect as well. Thank you very much, Kun Pen Chom. So, uh, Dr. Wisenuk, uh, are you with us? Home. Okay, so if I may, may introduce, Dr. Wisenuk, uh, he has prior uh, engagement for uh, today's session. If I if I may, he is 
a professor at Casesa ah. University. He works in a number of fields and also he has been awarded with uh, a number of, you know, from a number of institutions. He is the environmental economist. And uh, since, uh, even though he works in a number of fields, he focuses his work on climate change and also the agriculture sector. And he's one of our uh, team and he is the editor of the blue paper. So Dr. Wisano, I would like to ask you a question. As we have, as we are, as we are aware that the severity of air pollution problem, the environmental problem, and to solve any problem, there needs to be a budget assigned for that or allocated for that. So what is the current situation or current uh, status of the budget for Thailand that has been and, and also the designation or the allocation of that budget to solve the environmental ภาครัฐนะออกมาดูกันเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่นเช่
โดยรวมของแผ่นดินเนี่ยนะครับ uh, we, we allocated เราจะพบว่า uh, minimum budget to fix the environmental issues comparing to no other stuff นะครับนะเขาประมาณหลายจุดนะประเทศจีนนะ 2.5% เหมือนเดิมครับประเทศไทยมีสัดส่วนน้อยมากนะครับเมื่อเทียบกับนะทั้งสองประมาณ 2.5 ชาแนลเพราะฉะนั้นแล้วเนี่ยนะครับก่อนหน้านี้เราเห็นภาพแล้วว่าผลกระทบมันเยอะมากนะครับและเราก็การแก้ไขปัญหาของเราแต่ด้วยจำนวนเงินที่เรามีอยู่เท่านี้เนี่ยนะครับคำถามคือขอหรือเปล่านะครับก็เป็นสิ่งที่น่าจะต้องตอบว่าไม่น่าจะพอหรือเปล่านะครับครับนั่นคือเป็นข้อมูลของภาพนะครับที่อยากจะให้ทุกท่านได้รับทราบนะครับว่าบ้านเราเองอาจจะต้องพิจารณาในความสำคัญกับแวดล้อมที่มากขึ้นในปัจจุบันที่ให้ความสำคัญที่น้อยลงหน่อยนะกับการเจริญเติบโตทางเศรษฐกิจทำยังไงที่จะสร้างสมรภูมิได้ในสิ่งแวดล้อมทางเศรษฐกิจรวมถึงสุขภาพนะครับไปด้วยกันได้ครับเพราะว่าสิ่งแวดล้อมทางเศรษฐกิจรวมถึงสุขภาพนะครับไปด้วยกันได้ครับ Thank you, Dr. Wisanu. It is very shocking to see that it's this low. Thank you, Dr. Wisanu. It is very shocking to see that it's this low. And also uh, taking into account the presentation from Dr. Vanessa, air pollution does not really affect only our health, but uh, but also it is the factor of climate change as well. It will affect agriculture and so on and so forth. There are a vast second range effect that be, can be caused by air pollution. So. We, the the objective of hosting webinar is for those of you, the audience, to actually have the opportunity to ask the the experts directly. We have allocated a slot in this session for a Q and A, and also there is a function here on the low on the panel on the bottom of the screen, which is labeled Q and A. You can post your questions in that. We have about twenty. 30 minutes left. If you have any questions at all, please do put your questions in the Q&A box. This is basically an, a, a golden moment because you will not have you will not have the opportunity to ask or to get in touch with these experts again. Especially, Kun Dr. Wisanu, he just basically ran out of the cabinet meeting to join us on this webinar. So, if there's no question, I'm going to be asking question. So, uh, Dr. Wanisa, I do have a, a question for you relating to the air measurement, air quality measurement device. Can you clarify or probably explain to us as to the overview of this particular device? What is the standard of the device, and also what is the standard amount that would be required, or the amount that would be sufficient? And also, do we have the sufficient amount of that? In Thailand, thank you, uh, we, uh, Kunwina, from the, for the question. Very good question indeed. You know, try to imagine that we have been talking about PM 2.5 for for a number uh, quite for quite a while now, and also we hear the impacts on our health from other speakers as well. Currently, the PCD is uh, in charge of of. Supervising the air quality measurement stations in the northeastern part of Thailand. I think the station is in Korat or in Nakhon Ratchasima. While in the north, since uh, the north has been on the news quite uh, for quite extensively in the past, so there are about nine stations in nine provinces in the north of Thailand. And also, according to the website of the PCD, we have about 14 stations in Bangkok and Greater Bangkok, which is quite impressive because we used to have about two to three of that in Bangkok and in, uh, in the metropolitan area. In the south, we have that in Hat Yai and Songkla area. And I would say that the information from the south, or from the southern, the the three southern provinces, the information that we receive is quite, not quite, you know, solid. And also, uh, I would say that we we are relying on the standard of the US EPA. And. It is very important for the environmentalists to to get together and you know discuss about the issue because 
from the last few years, we can see that people, the you know, the, the citizen, the people, they purchase their own air quality measurement device, but we need to really make sure that, that those devices are up to standard. And also, Thai people, we have the capacity and we have the expertise to actually create our own devices as well and, and make it up to standard. Because we can see that the severity of the problem, but the thing is that how can we make sure or how can we know for certain that the, the level of exposure that we're receiving every day, we need, we need like a standard quality measurement that can be relied on. And this is a very essential topic and very, very essential issue. And also I would like the, the network to actually uh, put more shine more light on this. I would like to add from Kun uh, Vanessa is that, as you said that in the northeastern part of Thailand, there there's only one station in Nakhon Ratasima and not in Konken. I have to say that it's uh, I would say that since my hometown is Konkan, I can I can tell you that Konkan is the province that has been affected very greatly by you know agriculture burning and air pollution as well. But even with that, we do not have any device to to uh, measure air pollution or air quality. And also in the north, even though there are nine stations, but those nine stations are basically grouped in big cities or larger cities, but not, you know, all over the region. So it's like we are now trying to station those devices in in major cities. And, and it's like this will lead to, you know, the issue of inequality. It's like we are trying to develop or try to urbanize larger cities rather than, you know, to make sure that everybody can have access to air quality. Yes, um, since with, with, the, with the cost of the device, since we have been, you know, allocated with this particular function for about 10 years now, I would say that that particular budget does not really reach the, the rural area. The budget that we have for this particular task is not much. And, and with that, we have, there's, the, the chance of the rural area to actually have access to the air quality measurement device is even lower. And we, they have to basically wait for the central budget to be allocated for them to, to get one. For example, in Konkan province in the northeastern part of Thailand, the SOA of the uh, Konkan province, they will have to basically take care of the issue, but they would say that they do not, they have not been allocated the budget. So it's like we are now relying on the civil sector or the civil society and also universities for them to actually produce the low cost sensors. But they, but these sensors, these low cost sensors will have to be uh, tested and to make sure that they can measure the air quality based on the reliable standard. And also, we have to really uh, conduct research as to the awareness of the people. Do they know that, they, that this particular measurement is very essential? If I, if I may interrupt, uh, the issue just raised by uh, Dr. Wanisa is very important because you know, in Bangkok, we don't have much, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have as many devices as we should have. And it's just like the number increased just very recently, you know, because the awareness has been, you know, greater in Bangkok. So this is basically uh, the, the, good example that if the people is more concerned, if the people can come out and speak out about their concerns about air pollution, uh, about their, their, the air pollution, then probably this will lead to a more, uh, this will basically encourage the, the policymakers and also the, the public sector to 
you know, provide more devices. It's like they will provide more device for, for provinces or for the area with higher awareness. And as I have been working with Dr. Vanessa for quite a while, we are, not, we are in the process of trying to find a solution and also try to, you know, encourage the manufacturing of the low cost sensors and also the system of air, uh, citizen air as well. So I would like to invite Kun Virun to basically jump in and explain to us about this. Yes, I've been, you know, I've been trying to jump in uh, a minute ago, but anyway, so if we compare between uh, PM 2.5 and COVID-19 that we're facing at the moment, we can see that at the beginning stage, there is a very high level of concern, of awareness, of worry. Uh, people will keep asking themselves whether they got it already, whether they got the, the virus already, and they need access to, you know, to the test of the COVID-19 test because that, that, that happened because they see the impact or they see the result that will happen to them. Similarly for PM 2.5 situation, it's like we never really understand the impact of PM 2.5. So the awareness of the people, for them to, for the people to actually know the, the PM 2.5 situation or even other, other issues of air pollution is, but lower if we compare that to, to the issue of COVID-19. So the reason, the reason why we mobilize so many resources, uh, so much resources to, uh, to tackle the problem of COVID-19, that basically comes from the awareness of the people as well. And it's like with the awareness and with the imminent threat from the COVID-19 situation that lead to a collaboration between the civil and public sector for them to work together and, you know, control the disease, control the spread. So that we can lead to the, the uh, citizen air monitoring system and also quality health injects these are long-term projects. And last year we uh, exploit the, we, we use the opportunity when people have more awareness related to air pollution to encourage more collaboration between a number of organizations. As Dr. Vanessa has put out that we have been working with universities and other, you know, civil, uh, other organizations in civil sectors as well. I myself and my colleague, we try to basically put forward this particular issue of air pollution. We try to raise awareness. We try to uh, encourage people to have more awareness. And also we try to encourage the use of technology. The technology required for the low cost sensors, we, we, we really need to show that this is the desire, this is the demand or the, the need of the people to have the device available. And also, this is just to say that with the information from the low cost sensor, that would be adequate. We don't need like a very costly, very expensive sensors to be stationed at our, in our area. It's just that we need the device that can give us reliable data or reliable information for us to, to basically use that information to tackle the problem or for, to raise awareness and so on and so forth. So there are issues relating to you know, arguments, standards, and other problems that we'll have to basically try to go over them one by one to, to ensure that, you know, people will have the, the awareness and so that they can come out and demand or, or put forward their concerns or their needs so that the government can basically provide these devices. I don't, I'm not sure whether I answer your question, Kunwina. I think that's an excellent answer. 
if I may also jump in as well. Just to add a little bit, today, I'm going to be the first one to be elected as the director of the Office of 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 the Director of the Office Now we are in the process of trying to get more budget to ensure that every province in the country can have one. But I don't think that will happen anytime soon. But you know, if the budget plan has been approved, that would successfully have the station in every province. So if I may go into details, the budget that I have presented earlier, the 12 billion, if we dissect that into, break that down into more detail, we can see that the majority of that allocated budget will be basically waste management and ecological budget and so on and so forth. I would say that specifically on air pollution issue, the budget is even less than three billion. But we have to first understand that air pollution is not an acute thing. It's not sudden. It's not an immediate issue. It's a long-term issue and it's a concurrent one. So we need to really have a budget that will be allocated concurrently as well. Also, we have questions from the audience. So during the period when, when the PM 2.5 level reached its highest in, in the northern region, and also with a higher number of patients, can we really confirm that such illness has been, has been caused by PM 2.5? So this is the question to, to all of you or any of you, if you would like to you know, answer. Basically, the question is that, is there any correlation between the illness and PM2.5 uh, in the Northern region? Yes, I can, I can, I think I can clarify on this issue. I, there are research conducted by professors in Chiang Mai University, Dr. Pripawan Bramon Monthon from the Health Informatics. And also there are uh, the, the officers from the health sciences in Chiang Mai as well. They are, they are still working on, on the issue. And I can confirm that there is a very solid correlation between PM2.5 and the illnesses of the people in Chiang Mai. There are paper and or literature, you know, the, the research that has been published that there is a str strong link between the illness of people in Chiang Mai and also the, the issue of PM2.5, not only in Chiang Mai, but in Songkla, which is in the south of Thailand as well. And also the Jula Pond Institute has been working on this as well. And I think that the paper is about to be published very soon. But again, you know, I would like to confirm that there is a very strong correlation between illness uh, whether it is the respiratory syndrome and you know other other health conditions and and the issue of PM two point five, I think Dr. Wirun can shine a light on this. Yes, if I may add, as Dr. Wanisa has has told us a moment ago, that there were uh, there was a, a research more and more research has been conducted. And in order to tell or to confirm whether the illness comes from PM2.5, there is, you know, there is a way to, to, to find an answer and that is through research. So I think we are now on the path that when we have the awareness of the people and the interest from the public, we will have the research funding and also we'll have a stronger network that can work together to, to ensure that the research give us the result that we are looking for. So also the 
the fact that we are now together in this session today, even though we're not in person, meeting in person, we're meeting virtually, but I think it is a very important step because I think most of us that are joining are those who are really working in this particular field. So I will basically invite all of you to join us in working with the network. Thank you so much, Dr. Virun. I think Dr. Virun has taken over my, my job on recapping the session, but still, since we are now uh, nearing the end of the session, I would like to end the Q&A session. For those additional questions, or if any of you have, you know, after giving one or two days thought and you have any other questions from this session, please do so. Contact us from uh, uh, at so, uh, Circular Design Lab, or you can contact Kunwina for, for, uh, to post your questions. And also, I would like to thank, take this opportunity to thank the speakers. You know, I, it's, uh, you have been, you all have been sharing very insightful information. And never, we have never really understand the complex of air pollution problem or air pollution problem. I do believe that I can say, you know, on behalf of the Thai people that we don't really understand the issue. We don't really understand the component of the particular matter. But, but today we got to really understand the component of the PM2.5 from Dr. Vanisai and also from Dr. And also from Dr. Virun, we have been uh, we have now come to know the health impacts caused by PM2.5. And one thing that has been one thing that has been shared by Dr. Virun is that during the climate or uh, during the air pollution crisis, we also need lockdown. There has been no lockdown like ever during the the period that the air pollution reaches the crisis level. But but you know when it's COVID-19 when we are faced with COVID-19, there is lockdown, but not for air pollution. And also the level of threshold, the threshold that each country may allow their kids or their, their uh, children to be exposed to air pollution. That is a very important issue. And I would like that to be our key takeaway for today's session, you know, so that we can really understand and really, and that we can really put a stop or we, so, so that we can really prohibit or prevent our kids from, from being in the room with, with uh, very intense air pollution. And next, I would like to thank uh, Kun Pen Chom for, for uh, shining a light over the issue of ind industrial uh, air pollution. And also the story and the story that you share about chicken eggs of the chickens in the area of uh, the industrial factories, I would say that, you know, it's very interesting. And that is, you know, very, very shocking because, you know, we, we consume eggs every day, especially Thai people, you know, we eat uh, eggs are basically our main source of food, but we never really thought about dioxin that maybe, you know, that the eggs that we eat may contain. Also, uh, Dr. Wissanu, it is very, what you share with us is, is very insightful, especially on the budget. And, you know, it kind of, kind of, uh, make us think that even though with very fabulous or very strong economy, if we cannot really go out and enjoy the, the air in our country, it's basically useless. And I would like to uh, thank all of the speakers and, uh, and also for the insights that you have shared with us and we can take that further steps, uh, take that for, for our for further steps that we can you know, work together to you know, create a movement on this. And also, in this opportunity, I would like to share with you the next steps that we'll be working on after today. Okay, so now we can see from the screen that you can, you can, you know, check out our website at the thailandcan.org. And also, you can get your copy of the white paper from this website as well and also the blue paper as well. I myself, I have to say that I just finished reading the white paper. Now I'm starting uh, on the blue paper and I have to say that the information in that, in those two uh, papers are very, very important and very useful as well. And further than that, you can check out the work of Circular Design Lab from our website as well. 
and also our work relating to air pollution. You can access that from the website, uh, righttocleanair.com. And that's the English word version. For the Thai version, you can access the link on the uh, line below. And there is a menu in the website labeled Take Action. When you enter to that menu, you will be led to change.org. We have a campaign on change.org. You can enter the campaign and the campaign is basically for you to, you know, sign your name to, to, to tell us or to make a stand that we are trying to solve the air pollution problem and to raise awareness on the air pollution problem and that we need a serious solution whether it is through the legislations or you know other channels, we need the solution that is solid. You know, from that we can we will move further to collect the names officially to encourage and to push forward the legislation. You know, the Clean Air Act. This particular act will be tabled to the cabinet and then they can approve and you know issue uh, enact the 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 act so that we can have a solid legislation that will solve the air pollution problem and that will be a starting point for us so if you can please join us on in the change.org campaign and lastly uh, not really lastly uh, before we depart next week on the uh, Wednesday, 26. Okay, on 5 p.m. Uh, let's join us again for the next webinar, which we will basically uh, use the information that we gained today to basically change the mindset or to change from air pollution into air assets. We're gonna be uh, listening from our experts on what is uh, relating to the, the definition of air assets. So I would like to give the floor back to Kunwina and to basically share with us what, would ha what, are ha what is happening on the 4 to 6 of September. You know, if for those of you who do not have any plans to go, you know, up country, or if you are joining, uh, if you are coming to Bangkok, on that uh, on the fourth to sixth uh, sep September, is there is there any activities that may be happening? Okay, so thank you, Kun Kin, on the fourth to sixth of September. If there is, if you have no plan, please join us at the BACC because the BACC is hosting an exhibition called Kong Kwan Prathet Thai and within that exhibition uh, environmental problem will be portrayed and also will be presented and the Thailand Clear Network and Circular Design Lab we are we have the opportunity to basically host an event and we're going to be presenting you uh, a number of interesting talks from a number of experts and also there will be workshops in that event as well you know we there will be like competitions or contests from from the kids as to so that they can you know tell us what what is their understanding relating to air pollution there will can be mimes plays as well you know so it's going to be a very interesting event or the whole fa your whole family can join so i would like to invite take this opportunity to invite you that on the 4th to 6th of uh, september you can join us in that event and i do hope that on that day we can uh, move further on the name uh, the name collections for the legislation that Kun Kin just mentioned. So I think this is uh, the time. I would like to thank everybody for your time for joining us in the session. And I do hope to see you again on the 26th of next Wednesday. Thank you uh, all of you and goodbye. Great, and thanks again for our translator. Simultaneous translation is not easy to do for that long. So big <laughs> thank you for that too. Thanks thank everybody. You, you're welcome. And we will see you next week, same time, same place. Take care. 
Okay.